We've come to Mayo for the latest volume of the Dublin Book Festival's Departures, their mini odyssey around Ireland. We've left the capital behind us and are touring the land, seeking musicians, poets and writers to find out about the landscape that inspires them. Oh, it's hugely important. It, it's generative ground which all of my work comes from. But you have to sit down and just listen to the birds and feel the heat, even smell the blossoms. And I think that's what nature writing does, landscape writing does. It helps others see. I've never thought to think about it in that way before. It changes the world. It changes that square inch of landscape that we're looking at. Exploring is huge for me. I don't think you're going to find stuff unless you go and explore. Mayo has always been a place apart, a potent land of coastal wilderness, of salmon teeming rivers, at least in the past, and bog blanketed mountains. It's, it's been a resonant place for my two guests today, for the novelist Mike McCormick and poet Alice Kinsler. Alice, is this a place that you're rooted in or tell me about landscapes that you do that have been inspiring? Um, I've grown up in County Mayo and for a long time, I don't think I ever wrote about it, but then reflecting on it, I think it's been in every piece I've ever written for probably because I wasn't setting out to write about it. The place I'm most rooted in would be uh, Central Mayo, just outside Clare Morris, specifically in my own parents' garden, which is a was a field of a farmhouse and is now a beautiful garden. Um, I think of limestone stone walls and the ash trees that surround the property and the mist and the dew on the ash trees and the cows that belong to our neighbours that stick their heads over the gate and, uh, and get licked on the nose by our dog. And that very much that gentle mayo farmyard countryside um, with the tall trees and even the clouds of midges even the even the, the you know the bits that would, that would drive you mad like that would be kind of you know my all of my work is kind of marinated in that and like when you think of those the limestone walls and the, and the ash trees is that your modern poets your sort of grown-up poets mind seeing that or is it your childhood mind Probably both. I think perhaps being a poet has stopped me ever escaping my childhood mind. Um, but it has, it does look remarkably similar to when I was a child. Um, uh, but it would have been, as a, as a child, I would have been surrounded by the trees and the conquer trees and the, um, the hills and the bog. But definitely returning to it, you don't really look at landscape as much as a, as a child. It was just the backdrop. It was, it was just the, you were always imagining something else over it because you're living in an imaginative world. And then coming to it as an adult and as a poet, you're still living in an imaginative world, but you are making it much more out of what has what has formed you and what you're around. And that's probably why I keep coming back to Mayo as well, because I'm, you know, poetry and writing of all kinds is in, in I think, is um, you're trying to find your way back to that complete, focus that flow of play and that you know innocence and uh sense of possibility that comes with being a, a child that's beautiful <laughs> I, like uh, i normally i think there was an idea that poetry in the past was about you know making posh references or getting away <laughs> from anything childlike you have a different and your poetry is so accessible it's so rooted it's so guttural that it reminds me it does almost have that stripped back in innocence of of childhood so is that a conscious thing is that a, is that a different type of poetry than we learn in school that's what you're... I don't think so um honestly I just thought of it now <laughs> but no I don't think so I think it's got to do with a poem has to be accessed by a person and then any poem if it speaks to you in in that way can be that poem I would have found that freedom and that kind of joy in poems that I read in school and Frost and in Wordsworth and though the language you know the language wouldn't be as accessible now you know Wordsworth wouldn't be something that we would hear in everyday speech at the essence of it 
the walking in nature, the, you know, the appreciation of beauty of being alive is just the same. I think really, I don't think it's any different. Um, it's just speaking a slightly different language, I guess. Hmm. Like, like having this like spirit, spirit shocking one. No trace of them out here. I walk for hours. No wheels or roar, no wires dissect the sky. Press feet into the peat, forgive the feeling of my weight. Destruction is my nature, turning one thing to another. Hear the breathing of the bog, the noise I lift my foot, the moss resists the crush. So sponge wrung out refills. Walking on once water where the trees were felled, iron rushed back to earth, nothing pulling life towards the light. Man's first touch, forest cut, swift as hair, to build, to burn, consume. Plants scream when they die, when you kill them. I could be misremembering or lying if a tree screams in a former forest. Hear the breathing of the bog, centuries of dying growth. Below me there are bones. Cut down a foot, a millennium, more. Lift the layers for the fires, fuel the hearth, the houses where the people sleep, rise up and run the oceans down the drain, drive to work, carbon leaking out of cars into the atmosphere. The air is turning black. And Mike, what about place for you? Is, is landscape, is place important? Oh, it's hugely important. It's, it's the kind of generative ground out of which all of my work comes from. Um, I always say that when I when I when I pick up my pen that there that there's a, a pull in the steering of my pen and it just takes off towards Mayo and it doesn't matter what part of the world I'm in and where I'm writing and looking look and I'm lucky enough to have seen a, a, a bits and pieces of the world and that but it seems like you know Mayo occludes everything and that's fine with me uh, it's been very fruitful and very generous to me and long may it continue i would have known so the places that that for me i was listening to alice there and, and alice talking about her, her, her childhood relationship with it it's pretty much the same for me my 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 sense of landscape was minted in childhood but i suppose minted in some non-verbal way in childhood and recovered as an adult uh, once I got to my twenties and thirties and that, uh, and has become ever more, ever more valuable to me. And the, and the places that are the places that are that are most valuable to me are, are North Mayo, where I lived with my my grandparents. Um, I lived with my grandparents, you know, for about two or three years as a child, and went back every summer. And it's a village called Dahoma, and uh, it's 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 flat and immense, huge skies over it. And the land ran from the house in a level, as level as a football pitch, right out to the sea, in which there was a, a low tide went on forever. There was a big black, uh, um, a big black shoreline below me, across from it was Ackle, an absolutely immense sky over my head. And behind the house, on the other side of the house, was commonage, it was open commonage, and that seemed to me like a prairie when I was a child. Um, so that was that was so. And there was no, there was no, there was no broadleaf trees grow up there. It's quite strange. Like once you get beyond, once you get, once you go under the bridge in Mulrani to go up that part of the world. In my childhood, there was no broadleaf trees. It's now, now quite a lot of it has been turned over to, to conifers and spruce and that. But, but back then it was, it was uh, pretty bald. And the other part, so that's North Mayo, and then South Mayo. Then I came uh, on my father's my father's place which is just outside Lewisburg in a village called Pultloss and that's a green hole and it 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 um it's a small village thrown down behind hills and it looks out on the sea and it's everything it's the complete opposite to North Mayo uh, it's craggy rocky um it's it's um kind of tight to the shoreline feels the run of the land is much shorter and everything so those two things ha had a dynamic very quickly a kind of a dynamic and a sense of landscape was laid down in my imagination as a youngster and that and um and one of the things we used to do was to we used to drive between these two landscapes because i because i lived in lewisburg and we used to drive up to north mayo so there was a sense of transition and a sense of a sense of difference was laid down very quickly 
And back then, we used to have to drive through, uh, we used to have to drive through Ballycroy, and Ballycroy then was immense, really huge, uh, because it was Bordemona spreading out to the horizon, and it was heather, and it's now conifers, and it seems darker, and it seems smaller, but back then it was absolutely immense. And um, like lots of things came together in my imagination as a child. I was a mad reader of cowboy books, uh, and um, you know, and, and so many times we'd be driving up there, and this was in a time, we're talking about the 70s, where everyone got into car with a feed of pints on them in the 1970s, and <laughs> every Monday morning there would be cars pushed up on ditches and lying over on their sides in bogs and everything and that. And I just remember asking my dad, like, what happened there? And he'd say, oh, that was Indians that did that. And that was, that was, uh, that was kind of, it minted that, that and my fondness for cowboy books. And cowboy books were hugely important to me. They gave me a sense of landscape as a dynamic, not as a, not as a canvas, yeah. but as a, as a, as a really dynamic presence in, in life and work and that. So all of those things were laid down in my childhood and have since become even more, more and more important the older I get. Hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's interesting because in, in Solar Bones, such local stories, such local references, and yet you're finding the universal in them. Like you refer also in the, in the book to that, to the bridge in Mulrani and how it's a divide between this world and another. And we understand that from cowboy cowboy films in our childhood, where the, the the cowboys would be going and they'd come to a bluff where they could be overlooked. It was that dangerous point, and after that, you were beyond the frontier. That's right, and you were you were you were in a desert landscape. Um, Louis L'Amour was one of my my favorite writers as a as a child, the Ameri the great American cowboy writer. And my father had a had a heap of those westerns in in a press at the end of the hall, and I read them, and very quickly came to a sense of very quickly came to a sense of landscape as as dynamic, as shaping, and as something that will be kind to you if you meet it on its own terms, uh, and definitely something which will overwhelm you if you disrespect it. And um, and there was a time in my life when when there was a time in my life when I was more familiar with the Mojave Desert than I would have been with the far side of Castle Bar. I would have been much, I'd have been much safer dropped in the Mojave Desert than I would have been in, in Shrule or someplace like that, <laughs> that uh, I would have been able to find my way out of it. I would have known, I would have known what sort of cactus was water bearing. I would have known, you know, that uh, I would have known the range of temperatures that, that a deserts go through at night. I would have been known how to treat a, a snake bite and all sorts of things like that. As I say, it was, it, those, those cowboy books in the west of Ireland and, and north and west Mayo came together in my head in a, in a very kind of a fruitful dynamic, something that persists with me to this day. I just, I, I want people to have a sense of Ballycroy, to get a sense of that wilderness idea they need to know when they, when you, you know, when you refer to Ballycroy, and there's that lovely moment when Marcus has, in, in Solar Bones, has this moment of despair with his family, and he heads up north, he heads, I thought it was to the badlands of Ballycroy, but it's not. It's the badlands of North Mayo and the something, something of Ballycroy, the, the or the Terra ter Incognito. Ter is it the Terra Incognito or the yeah. Terra Damnata? Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, 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 one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was a bit harsh on that place, sorry. <laughs> After seven weeks, my nerve failed, and I got into the car to drive north, up through Newport and Mulrani, and up through the badlands of North Mayo, crossing the terra incognita of Ballycroy, with its sweeping bogland which levels away to the horizon in an unbroken swathe beneath a sky of such gaping distance that Agnes would always claim the hazy blue washes out of which so many of her images surfaced was her ongoing memory of what she had seen from the back seat of the car during those summer journeys we took up to the grandparents' place. Driving through this bog terrain with nothing around us but rolling waves of heather and hills lost in a haze of distance. Comanche country, according to Dara, who at that time was well into his cowboy phase, ploughing his way through those old paperbacks my father gave him. J.T. Edson, Louis Lemour, Zane Grey, while deep in the bog, a chimney stack stood naked out of a concrete floor. All the stone walls carted away to some other project. A lonely sentinel now gazing into the distance across a sea of blue heather, 
with stacks of turf along the road and the odd car lying on its side in a shiach or up on a wall. These being the years before the breathalyzer put paid to drink driving and made redundant a generation of panel beaters. Crashed cars and vans which Dara in the back seat saw as most likely the work of Comanche raiding parties which ranged across these plains, coming from as far south as the Mojave Desert on the Galway border and riding northwest up onto the Eris Panhandle. Savage war parties who rode great distances by moonlight across these bad badlands, ranging far from their southern lodges into the homelands of the great northern tribes, the Cheyenne, Sioux and the Arapaho, or as they were known locally, Mitchells, Davits and Stephenites. So when, Alice, when, when you're talking about your childhood place and Mike is talking about his childhood place, I'm reminded of John Moriarty in Kerry talking about seeing that these places are mythic lands, the, the land of our childhood. And like your first poetry collection, Flower Press, refers to almost the questioning nation, how one questions relationships one has. One has to realise, actually, I, didn't tr I can't trust my childhood thoughts or even my young adult thoughts about people but what you both seem to be saying is your instinct about your place when you came back to it chimed correctly that you actually did feel the landscape and you're going back to relearn that connection does that strike a chord at all it does um i think when i was a young adult in particular when i was an adolescent you know you want to i think you're always obsessed with travel in a way you're always obsessed with um getting away from yourself I suppose um and that you can think that getting away from the place that you're from will help that and you know you want younger you're all about traveling in space and you know getting going to different places but I think as I get older I'm more interested in traveling in time and going back and seeing and the most effective way I can do that is being rooted in the place that I'm, I'm from um and uh, yeah, I, defi I definitely, I've come back to Mayo, having been away for the guts of 10 years, um, and I'm kind of finding a new appreciation for it, um, in that what I've found is, what I've, what I've been comparing it to recently is, um, I've never set out to write about my mother, ever, but she's, in everything, she pops up in poems, she pops up in, you know, in, in essays and stuff, um, almost as the background because that is what you end up treating your parents like the background your foundation the thing you take for granted and since I've become a parent as well I've been I've just kind of changed my relationship with both where I'm from and who I'm from and kind of I'm very interested in more in, I suppose the closer you get to becoming history the more interested you get in it <laughs> um and I don't have the same urge to to leave the, the leave the county never mind leave the country um and i just but i want to know every little inch of the place and the kind of history of it and even just been re researching you know where houses were on our little lane and you know that the past the past that existed not just 50 years ago but there was a different world 50 years before that and a different world right here on this piece of earth you know and 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 i've just just become a bit obsessed, kind of falling down a rabbit hole with it. Um, so yeah, def definitely that does that does resonate. And you have you have that line um, in one of herself neglecting heritage before drowning in it. Yes, yeah. That's, that's that move. Is it from just yeah not really thinking about the past or landscape and then just realizing it is the thing. That line in particular is um, is uh, so that would have been written when I was actually in in doing my masters in NUIG with Mike um, under Mike yes yeah <laughs> but um it was in it was in poetry and that was referring to I suppose looking at outside of Ireland that that sequence is, is written in um in the moors of uh of northern England in around Wuthering Heights country um but I think there's actually a lot of comparisons between that landscape and I was obsessed with moorland and Wuthering Heights and the rocky crags and that when I was about 17, 18 um, 
and I would have gone there a few times. Um, but then when you look at somewhere like Ballycroy or um, out even even out near Kilpatrick and and Lewisburg, you've got these huge expanses of you know peat and moorland and the heather and the you know and I mean the Brontes were Irish as well and you've got a lot of a lot of connections there um and I, that poem in particular was kind of about the the weight of being an Irish poet and, and you know it's like to write about Ireland and um and I think getting away helped definitely and you know you want to feel like it's your choice to come back and and explore this place and really feel I mean I feel completely at home here now in a way that I never did kind of growing up um probably has more to do with being comfortable in your own own skin as you get older and you can really you know settle into a place yeah but your your poetry is doing something really potent like I know why I feel a cad to be leading these conversations because I'm always I don't really I don't notice the weather sometimes I don't notice landscape I'm in my head I'm in these tar- horrible non-embodied people but you reading your poetry I get find myself immersed in the landscape. For two things, almost a female attitude, or almost how the landscape and nature has this seasonal female. Whether it's your poets about poems about bog, about about Hayworth, about that area, or about or even Balneskelligs, you have a way of going onto a landscape and making me you rooting yourself into it deeper and making me see it, making me actually feel it, making it palpable. Oh, thank you, um, Balneskelligs. You mentioned I. My grandfather is from um, Port McGee in, in Kerry and I think his, his generations before him would have come from over, slightly over, would have come from Balanskelligs. Um, and I went there, I went to Kilrelig on residency in 2018 and I am a massive scaredy cat. I, am, I cannot stay alone in my own house um, uh, without hearing creaks and bangs. And yeah, this was a, a, a famine cottage convert- and I have never been so relaxed and so at, at peace in my life um and yet all i was hearing was now oh there's ghosts in those cottages i mean if you go on twitter there's some interesting threads and interesting experiences of people that i would have never have, have, have thought of as um as superstitious would have you know experienced um something supernatural there and i ended up writing about that because I was you know walking around and I was thinking it's I feel so at home here but my ancestors are from here this is you know this is the the landscape that my grandfather would have been familiar with this is my grandfather always um when he's talking about Kerry um he always prefaces it with long go long go and it always it comes kind of almost into one word long go and uh and I always think of that when I'm when I'm thinking of Kerry um and I just feel so at home there, so at, and I wonder if that, that has anything to do with it.
So in our previous talk in Wicklow, it was quite positive about land and landscape. But when you come to Mayo, one realizes there are other resonances embedded, embedded in the land. <laughs> Mayo contains multitudes, yeah. It, 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 um, as you said at the beginning, it has this dynamic of mountains and flatland and everything like that. Personally as well, and, and I think before we, before we get caught up in notions of landscape as, as, as exclusively a matter of fields and mountains and shoreline and that, the two, two of the very first um, landscapes I encountered and was mindful of in May were industrial landscapes. And one of them was the, was the Asahi plant in, in Kalala. Huge presence in my imagination cause, because uh, my, my own godfather worked on it and we had a sense of it in that time all the men from North Mayo worked on it and we had a sense of it as a huge pharaonic project up there on, in, 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 in Kalala and I, I only saw it for the first time uh, not so long ago and it's still an impressive, it's still an imp impressive construct and of course it went the way of a lot of dirty industry did. In the, but the other one that, that was important is, is, um, is Allergan Pharmaceuticals in here. It was a huge presence in my imagination because I was a farm boy and nothing around me but wet sheep and, and walls and everything. And I used to go, and for one year I worked in Allergan. And I used to go from that into a place where there was pristine laboratories and pristine laboratories and uh, brilliantly organized warehouses and that and those two those two there's a dynamic there that informs an awful lot of what I what I did I saw my first kind of robotics my first sort of my first sort of people dressed up in hazmat suits and everything the kind of science fictiony thing that govern that streaks through my work that came as a result of seeing this this um, really high-tech really high-tech place um, a place which now, if anyone is interested, gives something like 50% of the world's Botox comes, comes out of it on that. So it has this, so there, it has this kind of, um, this, different, this different dynamic, sheep and, sheep and stone walls on the one hand and pristine laboratories on the other. And it has quite a big, it has quite a big industrial uh, um, uh, background in, in, in Mayo has on that. But that was, that was hugely important to me and it gave a, a great sense of possibility. I was reading science fiction at the time and, and, um, and that all fed into that, you know, these laboratories where, where, these laboratories where privileged knowledge and cutting edge science was being pioneered. Um, it was a really enabling discovery to find that out at the age of 19 and 20 that this was happening just over the road for me, that we really were something, we really were at the cutting edge of what was being done. Actually, what was being made was eyewash for, 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 for contact lenses and that. And, um, and even that, that was kind of, even that, even, even, even contact lenses were kind of futuristic when I was growing up on that. So, so that was, that, those two things formed a, a part of my, part of my idea of Mayo. But there's also a part that, that um, Mayo as a, as, a, as a place of penance and atonement and possibly a place of, of forgiveness. I, it, I, I, I can't get over the fact that there are so many penitential shrines in Mayo. Uh, you know, I lived, I lived under one. Uh, I, I lived four or five miles back the road here from Croke Patrick. I live right under it. In fact, when I mean right under it, we as kids used to just run straight out the back door and up the mountain. Okay, <laughs> didn't, have, didn't have to deviate from it, just go and straight up. Um, and there you go, you went up and you did your stations of the cross at the top on that. We used to go to Knock, and then there was prayer houses in Ackle and everything like that. Why is that? Do we see ourselves as especially needful of... Why is it, Alice? Do we see ourselves as especially <laughs> needful of, of, of repentance and atonement and that? Um, because it strikes me that there's an unusual, there is an unusual amount of it, and, and it kind of lades my characters to speak of Mayo as a, as a purgatorial place, as a, as a place of, and I was thinking about that, and I, I, I was thinking about that coming down the car, I was thinking, you wouldn't want to get hung up too much on the suffering in purgatory, because you're there for 
a, you're there for forgiveness and it's a place from which you can emerge pristine and shriven and everything like that. So I think that might be the, hope, the hopeful element of it. But there are things that people gravitate towards that and certain circumstances gravitate towards that. I didn't make up the story about the hermit in Mayo. I didn't make that up. She lived out in, until very recently, she, she lived out in Drummond and she had, and it was one of the last things that Pope John Paul II did was he dusted down this license to make her a licensed hermit. And she had the whole world, world to go hermiting in. But she didn't choose the whole wide world, she chose Mayo. Why? I don't know. And we've spoken about how Mayo has given three of its sons in peacetime to the Republican cause. Three of them have, three of them have, have died on hunger strike. And, and has any county profited less from the Republican ideal than Mayo? I don't know, but we still seem, we still, you know, we still seem a, see a wish to participate in it, or we still see it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a destiny to be wished for in that. So those are some of the things. That's the way that Mayo presents itself to me and my characters at the moment. I might see something else in, in, another, in, another, in another four or five years or something. Alice, does that chime with you, the idea that there is sins hidden in the landscape or, or that when we, yeah, when we engage with Mayo, at least in the past, there was an idea of shame or something to hide? Um. I think there's there's definitely an, an element of, of that. If there's when you drive from my parents' house to here, um, you go along lots of back roads and there's this the frequency of those Mary statues, the Marian shrines is there's so many of them. We don't know if there was just a particularly devout campaign there when they were all beating put up or, or what. But um I I think it probably you know, we've got such a complicated relationship with the church in general in Ireland and that I've I found I find that Mayo, I was actually just writing about this last night, um, about May and the month of May and Mary and obviously Mayo, the name isn't as far as I know related to, to May. It's just I keep finding these connections that aren't necessarily there. Um and Mary did apparently choose to appear in Mayo. And Mayo has made a lot of money out of that. <laughs> you know, we bring a lot of knock is really on the map. And when, if you say Mayo outside of the county to, to someone that's not familiar with it or doesn't know, uh, if I've ever said I'm from Mayo outside of Ireland, they either, someone will say one of two things. They will say, oh, knock, or they'll say, the person that lives upstairs and across the road's niece is from, <laughs> so you either, you know a Mayo person or you've heard of knock. Um, and it was really complicated kind of growing up here being, I was raised secular, I was raised atheist, my parents aren't religious, and kind of seeing that weight of Catholic Ireland everywhere in a space that was not necessarily overly open to alternatives. Now this was my perception at the time, and I've since kind of seen that it's I do believe that Mayo is one of the friendliest places in the world, and I'm have I'm not you know hesitating at all to raise my own family here, um, but not Catholic, and you do kind of wonder what weight what 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 people there was no alternative there was no alternative to to people to everyday communities, and the now we didn't have the mo a mother and baby home here they went to Tume. But we did have, you know, workhouses, we had industrial schools and we have killings all over the place. Um, Talk to me about killings. They, uh, I remember first coming across one. Um, my parents would be very interested in religious iconography and um, the, the relationship of Ireland with the church um, from kind of an artistic point of view. Um, we near us, um, we are very close to Moore Hall, um, the the former residence of George Moore, which was burned down somewhat accidentally because he was Catholic. Um, it was a Catholic house, and it was said that no one under his um, none of his tenants died during the famine, um, which is is huge. Um, 
but he the George Moores there's a big tomb for his family um and the lake you know you can see across the car it's beautiful lake um and the but right behind it we used to go for the walk there all the time right behind the the graves of the Moors um I don't I've actually been there recently and you can't tell at all but there used to be when I was a kid there was rocks sticking out from the ivy and there was these faint white crosses on them and I remember being told you know what they were and that was kind of an, an introduction to me of um of the church's treatment of mothers and babies and um unbaptized babies and I mean and so you know for someone that doesn't believe you're like well what does it matter why they were where, why they were buried there or not you know what's there's no difference between that soil and some other soil but if you do believe and you choose to put the babies in the ground there um and it was just something that haunted me and um that I that I really you know see you know you can't I don't think you can ever I, I couldn't ever judge anyone for keeping their faith if they were raised in that when you just weren't given an alternative and if you're also if you witness those kind of horrors you have to think there's something else or else how can you you know how can you go on I suppose um and the landscape is filled with that but the landscape is also I like to think that we can look at the the estate houses and the you know the most a lot of them are shells now and we can hopefully you know we can appreciate what they add to the landscape and what was suffered by Mayo people because of them and yet move on from that and I hope that one day we'll be doing that with the the shrines <laughs> um. you talk with such diplomacy and then your poems are so raw and strong so I'm wondering when you're going through the landscape are the feelings coming strong to you or is it when you go into poetry mode that you allow those emotions arise in you is it a separate I, yeah you're, I've, I've learned, learned to, to mellow myself out a little bit in a, but no when I was young I was well I was I was the same as a lot of teenagers I was a bit of a <laughs> I was very self-righteous very self-righteous um and uh I remember throwing a rock once at the local church window but luckily I have terrible aim <laughs> right by it um, but um I I yeah I do I have a lot more because at the end of the day Ireland has been under the shackles of England and under the shackles of the church and of the Catholic church and it was it's it's power it's not one specific ideology that makes any difference it's the power it's the power imbalance it and Mayo has always been you know we're out on the fringes we're in easy target we're unwanted and I think what Mike was saying about the um our willing suffering you know our martyrdom we're all we've, we've got a bit of a chip on our shoulder we're a very underappreciated county <laughs> you know and I remember a teacher in school actually saying um you know the west coast of Mayo was the best kept secret in the world um but I think we also want it that way you know we go look this isn't it amazing but you know get out <laughs> yeah <laughs> to have it and to complain about it yeah. at the same time yeah. yeah you know we don't want it to be ruined by being overrun but uh you know, I've, I, the number of times I've heard my parents say, my father in particular, because he's, he's not from there, but he's like, he thinks Kerry is massively overrated. He said it's too far away, you know, as if it's too far away from everywhere. <laughs> Kerry, too far away. <laughs> and he's saying North Mayo is just as, just as beautiful. And it is easily just as beautiful. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, you know, um, would you know the rawness and the, the the almost desolation of the of the, the the wild aspects of mayo are you know part of what make it so beautiful um now obviously i'm saying that as someone that has not lived in a community that has been affected by you know their young people leaving by insufficient resources insufficient public transport and um, so it's very easy as a poet to say no i really like that there's very few people there it's very pretty um probably not so much if you were living there and would occasionally like to be able to you know get on a bus or you know <laughs> visit a few shops or have um, mike i loved it the way that you acknowledged the uh, you know the 
the almost the impact of foreign direct investment of these industrial sites, which, you know, it, it, the likes of me, it's too easy to go <laughs> into rural Ireland and to just look at the rural. In fact, so much of it is dependent on this globalized commerce. Yeah. But both are still there to a degree, you know, the ancient yeah. rural and then the modern. Yeah. And we talk about there is, you could say there is some sort of a sense of a darkness to do with the ancient rural, but is there also an element of something powerful still staying there and almost a is it too romantic to say like a pagan energy or a knowledge that is beyond Christianity, beyond English? Oppression? You know, there, there is, there is, I, I, it, it's, it, it's, it, it, it is actually, that's a really strong point. It's, it's one of the things that I've tried to, that I've tried to write in my, in, in my work, particularly in Solar Bones and even more so in Notes from a Coma, is an abiding sense of community. Um, I, I think it's too easy for people to see rural Ireland as a place of darkness and as a place of where we're sleeping with our sisters and where we're beating each other over the heads with lies and things like that. It's too easy, it's too easy, it's sloppy and it's lazy. And actually, because my experience of rural Ireland, my knowledge of rural Ireland is where it's actually governed and toned by decent people forward-looking decent people who are neighbourly and who won't see you stuck and of course it has its Twin Peaks moods and that but that's not the governing mood it seems to people writing theatre and certain types of fiction seems to think that it is I remember when I started writing I remember when I started writing um, Notes from a Coma and um, the book got got praised for for you know for being original and for being for being original and for being for being technically kind of a, a, a um, experimental and things like that, and the most radical idea in it is that it was its depiction of rural Ireland as a place of decent people and community and neighbourliness and everything, where people weren't trying to screw each other over or take advantage of each other or blindly going after each other's land or something like that. I think that there is a there is a, a sloppy and lazy. Are that, are that crucially, we're not made up of Amadons. I think those things are, come so easy to some writers about rural Ireland, and it's not the case. It's, it's a place of good, decent people living decent lives, and that's what makes it hard to, work about, to, to write about. It's easy to write about drama. The quiet lives of people, that's the real challenge in some ways in that. Um, one of the things that I, that, that I think is, is, is kind of, I suppose, interesting about the place is, is, is that, that it has this kind of forward-looking aspect to it. We tend to think, when you think of landscape, you think of sedimented history, the shale beds of memory laid down under our feet. And it's an idea that's been given to us by, we don't have to think too far about it, but it's been codified by the likes of Seamus Heaney and people like that. But there's a, there's a sense in which, in which it's, 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 it's a standpoint, and, and, and certainly this is the way it is for me, it's a standpoint from which the world looks different, okay? If, if I go to Galway, the world looks different from Galway. But Mayo has a particular slant, light, angle on the world that's exclusive to Mayo, as everyone else's, and, it's, and, it's, and it behoves us to kind of, as a writer, I think, to capture something of that. You know, we, we, we're talking... One of the, 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 one of the ways it came to me was that, and I think back on it as a, as a child and that, was, was I, had, I had a very, even though I was brought up in a very small community in Lewisburg and Mayo, very tightly knit in that, I actually had an incredible sense of my family being all over the world, because they were, because they were in, uh, because they were in Boston and New York uh, and Kentish Town and Cricklewood. And my idea of family was that wide was geographically that wide. It wasn't Lewisburg. It wasn't Dahomey. It was Dahomey that stretched to Kentish Town and it stretched to Boston. And I was surprised, I was really surprised later on in my 20s when I met people who had, who came from a kind of a, you know, a, a, a different middle class and that, that didn't have that sense of familial extension and that. Their neighbours and their, their families were all around them. My family was halfway around the world. That was fine with me. I felt quite quite privilege in that but again that was something that was you know <laughs> I don't know if that's a gift of landscape and history in that but it was certainly something that was born out of Mayo in that and they would have I'm not saying that that's 
I'm saying that that's that's a it's something that was we were brought up with being out on on the western seaboard and that. Uh, we had this sense of, of uh, family. And incidentally, we were talking about, you know, it, it'd be great to not to look down on, our, not to think of the ground as the landscape under our feet and that we should remember that, you know, Ballycroy, we talked about it, and you know that Ballycroy was the last place in Ireland to get the electricity. Um, there's a place in Kerry that disputes it, but they're wrong. Um, but it's Ballycroy is the last place in Ireland to get electricity, to get the, the, the rural electrification. But it now has uh, a dark skies accreditation, uh, so you can. It's one of the purest black nights out there in Ireland, and that. And um, so we can look to the stars. We can look to the stars from from uh, from from Ballycroy and Mayo. And that's that's for someone. Actually, I was brought up again in North Mayo, brought up, and there was an immense darkness around me absolutely huge you could see a car coming four miles away and it was an event to see a car coming in the distance and that and um, but now um now yeah, let's be one of my projects for summer is to go down and see the skies in, in Ballycroy and that I, I look forward to that now immensely I have to say. Potent. <laughs> um, both Alice and Mike you have like given me a new way of looking at an area uh, that I hadn't explored before like of seeing the potency just like your novel just like your poems do so Alice Kinsler and Mike McCormick, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. That's all for this volume of the Dublin Book Festival's Departures. Mavila Boyachas, Asucht Vor Go Luder. We're going to head to Cove in Cork next time to meet the novelist Billy O'Callaghan and the poet Alice Taylor. 